Hello, everyone. Just a quick word from your friendly editor slash husband. For all of you who listen to So I'm Watching This Show and own an Android device, do me a favor. Go to the Google Play Store and download the Podcast Republic app. It's a fantastic app that allows you to get all of your favorite podcasts directly on your Android devices. I use the app and love it. I can search for the podcasts I want to listen to, select them as favorites, and have them all just a click away. Make sure you set so I'm watching the show as a favorite so you don't miss any new episodes. Again, the app is Podcast Republic, available on your Android device. Thanks! This was supposed to be a little break to, like, refresh us. (laughs) And we're somehow even more haggard. (laughs) It's just the world, man. Oh my god. I don't god. know what to do with the world right now. I'm I'm like so exhausted in a way like m- mentally and emotionally in a way that I on a global scale I've never felt this way before. Well, for context, we are recording this slightly uh early before you're hearing yeah. it. We're recording this uh June, I must say January. Who knows? It might as well be. Uh <laughs> June 21st. We watched this film like three weeks ago. We did. We just never got around to recording it. We did so not record it. So we're going to be nice it. and rusty with the movie itself. So all around we're at peak performance. So strap in. <laughs> Nothing has changed because I uh, just ate a bunch of pizza. And now I feel terrible. <laughs> I've had so much bread today. Oh my God. Yeah. I made avocado toast and then mm-hmm. I made tomato bread for lunch. It's just been like a bread bonanza over here. I don't know if we'll be able to record later tonight. You're going to be out of commission. I uh, well, <laughs> I don't, I think I'll be okay. My stomach doesn't hurt, but I also didn't take my vitamin that has all that caffeine in it mm. when I woke up this morning. Oh, and I didn't so, take my medicine either. Yeah. Like three hours ago, I started getting like a splitting headache and I was like, what the fuck is happening? And then I was like, oh, I didn't take my vitamin. So I took it and it took the edge off the headache, but I can still feel it in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're batting a thousand today. Hello, I am Will. And I'm Kristen. And this is, uh, we watched a movie a couple weeks ago, and now we're going to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) I feel bad for, like, kind of phoning in this movie because we both love it so much. Me too. But I was like, I cannot postpone this again. Like, I cannot put this off. And I had all these grand plans of, like, rewatching it and then, like, watching the the commentary and stuff. And it just. Yeah. But in my head, I was like, we've got this. We should have made Rachel do it with us because we made her watch it for the first time. Yeah. And it, like, blew her tits clean off. It did. It really did. I think collectively it blew everyone's tits clean off. But. Yes. We absolutely love this movie. And this is a movie that I I feel confident in saying for for the both of us that it, it it's one of the ones that grows on repeat viewings. I you would say yes. More I've gotten more from it every single time I've watched it. Well, you know, as a society we have fallen down down deeper into the crevasse if we're you will. Cl- we're closer to this <laughs> than I than I would have ever thought. Yeah. Yeah. We're not there yet, but <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it it makes me think of I had an old boss who was obsessed with like the hoarders and intervention and stuff. And she would always say, like, every one of every one of us is like one or two bad decisions away from being a hoarder. Sure. And that is how I feel about this. (laughs) We're just one or two more bad situations from being theory road. Like, yeah, for sure. (laughs) Um, For sure. I particularly thought it might be cathartic or therapeutic to watch this movie. It had been a hot minute and we've had this on our like short list since the beginning. Yeah. But we were like, because we like it so much, let's go ahead and save it for something special. And I guess this counts. Sure. Like, well, like we just said, we are rapidly approaching a real life apocalypse. Mm-hmm. So it's be- what better time than now? Well, and in in this movie, women are good and win so yeah. that's that's true. something that i could have <laughs> i could go for right now but true story do you want to do any establishing for mad max you've watched the first three correct i only saw the first one and oh, okay. i i thought you saw the first i three. didn't like it and then we did not continue because <laughs> will one... got will got mad at me <laughs> yeah, the first one, to my understanding, is very odd. Uh, it was in the 70s. I think it was like 78 or something. It's it's a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I watched like a little behind the scenes thing on it. And 79. Under- 
understanding is that it's a little bit more grounded and a little bit more graspable. Like it's a little bit more like street gangs type of a thing. Yeah. So the first one is like as the uh, the apocalypse is happening. Yeah. So they're like still is society at that point. Mm -hmm. And it is the like the cliche tragic backstory of the man whose wife and child die. And then he goes on like a revenge spiral. And then I think this series has very loose continuity because I think with the second one, it's like the same character, but it's like a generation or two into I'm not sure. But my understanding is they they get cornier. And like they get higher concept and kind of cheesier and they sort of retool things. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, this one, it, it, it's absolutely a sequel, but it is a quasi quasi reboot where, you know, we still have the dead wife and child. But this Max, th- this is several generations into the apocalypse and not as it's happening. Yeah. And I kind of like that. I, I actually was just watching uh, a Lindsay Ellis uh, video essay about Tolkien, about The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And she was mm-hmm. talking about how, like, The Hobbit is interesting because she was like, The Lord of the Rings is a sequel to The Hobbit, but The Hobbit is not necessarily a prequel to The Lord of the Rings. And so right. I feel like a similar thing for this, where it's like they, they sort of revamp the story as they go and as it's needed. And I would go ahead and say my understanding is that this is a story and a concept that was a little bit ahead of its time in the 70s. Because um, yes, yeah, the Fury Road is a masterpiece in every sense of the word. I 100 percent agree with you. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going with that sentence, but I yes, I agree. Well, it's astonishing. It, it, it's mm-hmm. a feat that I feel like could only be created in the decade it came out in. Sure. And rather than just remaking the first movie, it took what worked and then it added to it in, in really fascinating ways. And I remember being excited and scared for this movie. I thought the trailer was terrifying. Mm -hmm. I was very concerned because you don't really get a sense of the plot per se. I mean, you know that Charlize Theron has girls that that crazy warlord wants. And I just have a very vivid memory of them on this, like the the sticks, whatever they're called, grabbing Zoe Kravitz out of the car. And I was like, this is going to be like high concept torture porn. Like I was like, this is going to be horrible. And I was like, the the girls are going to be dropping like flies. Like this is going to be terrible. I do think we should address that. I I feel it would have it would not be torture porn because I think we have to address the fact that George Miller also directed Babe Pig in the City and both Happy Feet movies. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> those movies aren't what about they say they're about. So. That's true. That is true. <laughs> Happy Feet is a doozy. Of <laughs> ha- Happy Feet is absolutely propaganda. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I, I just I, but I knew I had to see it. And I was very intrigued. And I remember going to theater and I remember just being assaulted from the very beginning Mm -hmm. it is the word full throttle gets thrown around a lot these days but (laughs) it 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 is a non-stop just like an onslaught of action of color of sense sensory information and i cannot stress the non-stopness of it and so i sat there for about the first 20 minutes horrified i (laughs) thought it was hideous Mm -hmm. i hated everything about it I you was had offended. such a similar reaction to Rachel. I was offended. I almost felt like I would have walked out if I thought I could. But I was mm-hmm. like, I just didn't even know when to take a breath to stand up. Right. And I do I do want to go back and talk a little bit more about some of the stuff in the beginning. But it was around the hurricane that I just felt the smile creeping across my face. Mm. And I was like, wait, is this actually brilliant like it's it's madness it's sheer madness but i am absolutely fascinated by how little this movie gives the audience to work with yeah i that was <laughs> that was definitely something i was going to bring up because it's like there's actually not a lot of dialogue no and there's there's very little like build up like stuff just starts happening and you come there's no act 1 yeah you come <laughs> upon the information as they dish it out And it's sometimes past the point when you needed that piece of information, but it puts the puzzle together. Uh So 
which makes it a very active viewing experience. Yeah. And and because so much of it is sensory, it's visual and audio, uh, audio we don't feel like we're behind per se. Like when we, like even though sometimes we're getting answers well after the questions, we don't feel bogged because we're not bogged down by it in in exposition and narrative. You know what I yeah. mean? It's very, oh, that's what they were doing. OK. Right. And like I said, we completely bypassed act one. And like the, the, the plot of this movie is it is several generations removed from a apocalypse, some kind of Holocaust. And the society, this is this is one of my single Probably my single most favorite thing about the language is my favorite, but this is mm. a, a facet of the fa- the language is a facet of this. But it's how much this world does resemble our world, but through a warped funhouse mirror. Yeah, it, it's very much like how when you put things into Google Translate and you translate it through two or three languages and then back into English. And yeah. it's like. It's kind of the same sentiment, but it's like gone in a kooky direction. You know what it actually is like? It's like that episode of Friends when Joey is writing the letter to the adoption agency for Monica and Chandler and he just uses the thesaurus for every word. <laughs> that's what it that's what it's really like. Because it, they all mean the right things, but in such a bizarre context. It's silly. Honestly, if it weren't so shocking and offensive, it's a very mm-hmm. silly movie because people are 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 screaming things like guzzling. And it's mm-hmm. like you understand how society can degrade so rapidly. Yeah. And, and again, it's fascinating seeing to seeing what sticks, because this is a world where they're essentially worshiping machines. They're worshiping mm-hmm. cars and gas because in this reality at this point that and water are like the two most important commodities right so the way that the rest of the society breaks down around those things is very fascinating and so it's a place called the citadel because i i i desperately want to see more from this world and i just don't know that it's possible this way i think not unlike the first three movies this is the kind of thing that if we continue exploring this world it's going to take decades <laughs> and there's re- another one in production and, already yeah. because I, I i feel like there's probably other tribes and possibly even more elaborate civilizations and stuff somewhere out there mm-hmm. you know what i mean like there's a green place somewhere, you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, what where where's the ocean? Like, can you? Because this is in Australia. They don't say it, but the language, the slang they're using is Australian slang, mm, yeah. and it was filmed in Australia. Um, George Miller is Australian. Yeah. But the plot is that there is a warlord in a place called the Citadel ne- named Morton Joe, and he has a harem of wives. And something called an Imperator, which I guess is a gladiator. She's like a, um, a general. She's like a warrior. OK, like a um, what do you want to call it? Shit. There's like a like a colonel or something. She's like a like a military type mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. So she is going on a supply run for him. General is sorry. General, general. is the word I was looking for. That was the second word I said. <laughs> Oh, I did not hear you. Yeah. Unless I cut off. Yeah, general yeah. is definitely the word I was looking for. So she is going on a supply run for them because you need supplies. And mm-hmm. we find and it's a huge celebration in this culture. And we find halfway through that she has off screen, like unbeknownst to us, she has made a deal somewhere with the wives to help them escape and mm-hmm. take them to this promised land place called the green place Mm -hmm. and it's just so interesting because you know we were at peak game of thrones at at this point and there's a lot to be said about for and against game of thrones and all that but one of the the most fascinating things about this movie is how we're watching a movie about slavery and in particular sex slavery and we didn't need to witness the like atrocity in order to understand the importance of the mission. Yeah. I like the last thing I want. And this movie needed was actually seeing Immortan Joe, like physically assault Zoe Kravitz. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you, 
And this is a movie that could have so easily done that. We wouldn't have, have thought twice about it. And it makes it somehow more powerful. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I don't I really ha- I'm not interested at all in getting into any potential backlash. The movie got or not potential. There was a weird backlash against the movie, and I'm not really interested in exploring it other than I think a lot of these things were perceived as political statements or stunts. But the the whole movie is that way. Like I said, mm-hmm. the, the movie, we don't have an act one. We only marginally get a backstory from Mad Max that we can we can fill in the blanks because it is cl- so cliche. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, because no, yeah. it is so standard, we're like, well, duh, obviously. <laughs> and so in that regard, the no, I don't think omitting that scene is a political statement because the entire movie om- uh, omits origin. Yeah, it really they really trust us, the audience, to be able to fill in the gaps in a way mm-hmm. that I really appreciate, because I I also don't think you have to be like a smart person to get this movie like it it makes you do some heavy lifting, but it's not that heavy. But it's all very easily connectable, you know, yeah, for sure uh, things. And so and so essentially you, this movie is a chase from beginning to end. It It, it is a full fledged two hour car chase mm-hmm. and it is so meticulously plotted and filmed and edited that like maybe three times do I ever kind of think, wait, what happened? Like it is so. Mm-hmm. And I found out that he actually framed every single direct action in the center of the frame. So oh, interesting. Our eyes aren't dot dark. He had a filter that he put over it. So anything hmm. important had to happen in this circle in the middle. And so our eyes aren't darting around trying to follow the action. And that's one reason yeah. why it is easy to watch, considering what you're looking at. I think he also is this the movie I, I was doing. I was reading trivia. I think it was this. He like storyboarded every. There wasn't a script. It was just a storyboard. Yeah. It was like every single moment of this mm-hmm. movie was storyboarded first, mm-hmm. which like if I could get my hands on those storyboards. The first. I bet, uh, I bet they're amazing. Yeah. Uh, the first script, quote unquote, is a. I, I saw a picture of it. It's a, it's like a piece of paper with like six scenes and it's like the wow. citadel the hurricane the canyon the like blah 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 you yeah. know what i mean and then from there they just build and they just like kneaded the dough out and made it bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger i mean it's amazing yeah there was no script uh so another thing that this movie does considering how you know high octane it is how, how fast paced full throttle it is is there are these moments where there will be an oh so crucial grounding element Mm -hmm. that reminds you that stakes are real and are there and that these are, in fact, humans doing human things. Mm -hmm. Because the earliest one I noticed is in the beginning when he's already, like, captured by the war boys in the Citadel and he's trying to run, escape, and he's running down that tunnel and he jumps to, like, get the hook. He tries to jump to, like, hook his uh, handcuffs on that hook hanging. Yeah. And it's such a graspable distance. Uh Uh-huh. Like, it's not like The Rock and Fast and the Furious 37, you know, driving sure, a car up the sure. side of the Burj Khalif. Like, or that movie Skyscraper. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's just yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the music is like, but you're you're watching such a such a well graspable thing happen. And it happens several times in the movie where when mm-hmm. it gets it gets it builds bigger and bigger and bigger. And then something very like tangible happens like even i mean jumping all around now but like when splendid falls she just kind of falls yeah it's not this huge like overblown production you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like and it's not it's and because it's rosie huntington whiteley it could so easily have been like you know framed so that her hair is like blowing and you know it's like they really don't focus on it yeah you see it happen but it's not (laughs) it's not a focus yeah it's fascinating i i do want to talk characterization you mentioned rosie i was gonna go right to the brides that's my that's our brand i really like these brides that is not surprising that you know that Mm -hmm. that's that's on on brand for me we were baffled by their names going in do you remember i do because i I remember before we saw this movie i was looking them up and i was like toast cheeto what the fuck is this i know all five of them it's the splendid and herod toast the knowing cheeto the fragile the dag and capable and we were like huh but then we while watching the movie it actually makes so much sense it does it really does because like toast it's zoe kravitz so it's like she's the one bride of color Mm -hmm. so they call her toast because that's the word they associate with darker Mm mm-hmm 
And she's the smart one, so they call her the knowing. And I did a little bit of research. There is so much mythology in this that is not in the movie. Yeah. Um, she's smart because she's the the last, the latest addition to the harem. Oh, she's only so she's been, been like in the world longer? Yeah. She's only been there for like two or three years. Okay. She do the fragile is the quote unquote fragile one. She's the emotional one. And Dag, well, she like, also is the one who can't hack it. Yeah. <laughs> like she tries to go back. Like, Well, the first time, because uh, yeah. when she tries to do it the second time, I fell for it. And I was like, come on, Chidu. But she it's it's actually part of. It's a trap. There yeah. you go. Trap. It's a trick. There you go. <laughs> and there's so many implications in this because there's like a weird implication that like and I don't necessarily think it's romantic, but like Chidu and Dag have a thing. It's Cheeto like like the snack. I thought it was Chidu. Are you sure? Yeah, I think they call her Cheeto. It's just one O. Okay. Are you going to go listen to it? No, oh. I was looking, but I I thought it was Cheeto because I watched a behind the scenes thing. Maybe it's just that Australian accent. <laughs> Maybe. Because uh, actually they call her fragile here. So. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, because again, Rosie is the splendid Ang Herod. So her name is Ang yeah. Herod, but they call her splendid. Blended, know. Yeah. You know how I am with weird names and shit. Like, I, I love that kind of stuff, but... It's just interesting. It's because you... It, it's interesting, ha- like, that the movie sort of forces you to do that work to figure out mm-hmm. why they're called that. Because otherwise it is just silly. hmm But I connected with Splendid immediately. And it's a very, of course, you know, because she's beautiful. And you caught me. Like, I respond <sighs> to beauty. I I think Rosie Huntington Whiteley is is a great beauty. And yeah, I saw Transformers partly because she was in it. Mm. And we'll talk about Transformers and what they did to Megan Fox. That's an entirely different conversation because I think she we'll, kind of will get there at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rosie, I think, takes some kind of she gets crap about that. And I'm like, well, she didn't do that. And of course. I mean, also, it's like to replace Megan Fox with a literal Victoria's Secret angel is like it's a slap it's in the face. It, it's rude in a way that Rosie doesn't deserve. Yeah, um, because here's the thing. I actually think she's fantastic in this movie. Yeah, she's great. And she she because when we were watching it with Will, he was like, well, I mean, she's in the movie. But I was like, I think she I think she does things. There, There are moments in this movie like. There's a moment where it's what sets the entire second act into motion. Mm-hmm. It's where she's trying to load the gun and she can't do it. Mm-hmm. So Toast takes it and she feels less valuable. Like she feels badly about it. And mm-hmm. it's the scene that happens in one second entirely on Rosie's face. And that's what then prompts her to go above and beyond because she's like an unofficial leader in this like the the implication is that this is her plan well she's the only pregnant one too Mm -hmm. or well she's not the only pregnant one she's visibly pregnant yes because the dag um, is pregnant also i read in the behind the scenes stuff that apparently she had been pregnant several times before and found ways to abort splendid yeah Oh, interesting. OK, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about uh, because also apparently she did this. The scars on her face she did to herself. Mm, yeah, it really did not work to make her less pretty <laughs> if that was what she was going for. <laughs> but that's what prompts her to behave the way she does later on in the movie. And mm-hmm. my favorite moment that she has in the movie, because because and, and this is all over the movie, but it's like it, it's watching one event to the next to the next to the next Mm -hmm. and so frequently there are people in just just acts of desperation they make a a movement or act that actually moves the plot forward because there's the scene where immortan joe has the shot at furiosa and he can take it and splendid sees that and she throws herself out the door to block because she knows he won't shoot her because that is another thing is how gorgeous And how well filmed this movie is. There isn't a single shot in this movie that isn't art. I don't even know how to explain. I like I don't know if it's because of how meticulously it was storyboarded or like like beforehand or like how like what or how they did it. But it it's wild. Mm -hmm. Every every you're right. Every single frame of it, you could print it out and hang it on your wall like art. (laughs) And also for a movie that is and could be so 
ugly they find yeah. all these ways to make it just beautiful mm -hmm. primarily through color but also through shape and it's yeah. something that george miller talked about behind the scenes where he was like we have this weird thing where we think you know in a post-apocalyptic scenario everything would be horrible and ugly and he was like no people would be clinging to what elements of beauty they could find and yeah, so that's definitely. why when you look at the cars there's all these weird details and like you can tell these people have scavenged like doll parts and pieces of mm -hmm. jewelry and stuff to make something worth looking at. Yeah. Like it's wild. It's fascinating. But back to Splendid, it's like she doesn't intentionally sacrifice herself, but she dies. She is one mm -hmm. of she's the only bride that dies. And I was furious. Actually, I was furious when it happened at first. And I had this whole hashtag justice for Splendid yeah. that came up a handful <laughs> of times. But I realized that I was like, it's necessary because if yeah. that hadn't happened, they wouldn't have gotten away. Right. Exactly. Sometimes the people that you like die and it sucks, mm -hmm. but it's necessary. <laughs> I just want it because, like I said, she she has the leader position and she very much kind of seems like a den mother to them. I wanted yeah. her to get through to the other side. Right. But I mean, sometimes, you know, the first person has to sacrifice themselves for the others to. Mm hmm to make it and her death is felt in the movie it is a mm -hmm. thing you know what i mean and yeah we haven't talked about max yet uh, he is incidental to this movie <laughs> but tom hardy is so good at this he at is this, pretty good like, at this gruff pouty like he the, he has what the witcher wants <laughs> mm, <laughs> this is what the witcher thinks it is interesting <laughs> He has so few lines and he is so feral, but but still human. Yeah. And the positions he gets put in in these movies, because blood is also a commodity in this world. The as you mentioned, because I forgot sometimes, but the war boys are inbred and toxic. <laughs> yeah, they're like they're like actively dying mm -hmm. every moment. They're also huffing chrome paint. So <laughs> it's like not, they're not doing themselves any favors. <laughs> well that's another example of like something that it's like the movie doesn't explain to us what's happening it shows us and we mm -hmm. just kind of get there we're like okay yeah. this is a religious ceremony you know <laughs> well yeah it basically is it's it's i think presented to them as a religious ceremony but what it actually is doing is sort of like just making them like crazy high so that mm -hmm. they'll go into these death Danger, situations yeah, yeah. Because that's another thing that I actually weirdly, it's weird to say that I like about this movie, but I do. Uh, I like all the scenes of just the bodies flying around oh. <laughs> because they're ve it's very, like I mentioned earlier, where there's moments where the action becomes very grounded. They are very grounded. There's a handful yeah. of times that a body just sort of falls off. And it's like we're conditioned via action movies and special effects to think of so much of this as explosive mm -hmm. and like... <laughs> Like there's like when the, the the hurricane like picks up the car, you can just see bodies flying everywhere. Yeah, like, everywhere. It's wild. But yeah, so Mad Max. So Max is a uh, blood bag for Nux and he fastens Max to the front of the car like a it, mermaid on the prow of the like, ship. Yes. <laughs> and at first I was like, oh, well, don't be silly. And I was like, that cannot be an like accidental like, no. <laughs> I think there's something fascinating about putting a man in that position in this mm, world. Yeah. And he's chained to Nux via an umbilical cord of sorts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, he's like, he's basically pumping healthy blood into Nux so Nux can go fight. <laughs> I, I saw someone on YouTube was talking about how it's like a weird sort of like mother child relationship. Because mm. Max ends up taking Nux under his wing a little bit. like A little, yeah. It, it, it's very, very, very odd. I feel like that's where Tom Hardy thrives. <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah, yeah, very, yeah. very odd. The stuff with him, not infiltrating, that's not the word, but like joining the women mm -hmm. is so interesting watching them. I also really, I quite enjoy his, his and Capable's timid little romance. It's very cute to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It almost feels like a requisite, like a requirement. And mm -hmm. the movie didn't need to, but it feels like the movie's nod to 
you know, the YA romance. Yeah. Like, because Capable is Riley Keough. She's and we, amazing. And we I like her a lot. Uh, Zoe Kravitz. And there was a part of me that thought they all should have been Legacy. <laughs> they thought, like, uh, we should have gotten yeah. Rumor Willis in there. And, you know, a couple. <laughs> well, Rumor but... Willis and Riley Keough are essentially the same person. So. <laughs> uh, Riley Keough is Elvis's granddaughter. Yeah. And she looks like her mother, I tell you. She really does look like her mother, yeah. <laughs> Lisa Marie. But yeah, watch, watching Max sort of become one of the women, he because he like kind of becomes an honorary woman in this movie. Mm -hmm. He really does, because once they do get to the like, the old women out in the, the desert, like, Volvo he like is, or whatever. Yeah, he like already is part of like Furiosa and the brides, but then they like, welcome him too it's mm -hmm. really it is quite fascinating mm -hmm. they're even like very nice to nux i really yeah the the sexual politics of this movie are pretty fascinating well it's a feminist manifesto and and so in that i find it fascinating that one of the themes of the movie is forgiveness like yeah. because nux has to earn it but he does and there's like the weird uh, no, it's not weird. It actually is very blatant. But the, the the entire subplot of the shoe, where it's like he takes Max's shoe, and then Max takes a shoe back, but then gives Nux another shoe, mm. and it's like it, it, it's just sort of the give and take. It's like the it's like a visual representation of the compromise and stuff. Yeah. Again, the the theme of the movie hope, like the fact that the women hope for something better, and then do take take charge of their lives yeah. and their fate and and like i said what what are they called uh, the the viv the, the vuvellini the vuvellini okay i see the word vulva and that's about it i think you're supposed to <laughs> okay okay <laughs> <laughs> i think you're i think you're maybe supposed to see the word vulva in that <laughs> okay <laughs> but they're so cool and, and this actually i meant to say this when we were talking about the brides explicitly but it's like we've talked a little bit about representation and how you know if a movie has one female character or, God forbid, no female characters, that's not necessarily a bad thing. The problem mm -hmm. is how frequently that is the case. Well, the problem is how frequently that's the case. And also, if you're misusing your single female character, that's also not great. And I mean, I don't want to get into like a whole thing about it. But when I was like, like furious, like steam coming out of my ears, furious while we were watching The Irishman, because... <laughs> You chose to get Anna Paquin. If you had chosen just nobody, fine. But you picked Anna Paquin and were like, come be in my movie and have three lines and then just look menacingly at Robert De Niro the rest of the time. And I was just like, the audacity <laughs> to choose Anna Paquin and do that to her is like, it's mind bending. But this is the type of thing where like you can have someone like Cheeto who sucks because there's <laughs> enough representation Across well, you can have the a, board. a character whose identity is fragile when she doesn't exactly. have to represent all women. Exactly. And, and how this movie manages to have women, young, old, beautiful, ugly, like mm -hmm. disabled. I mean, even they don't have material. They're not fleshed out characters. But even the mothers, like yeah. the, the wet nurses, yeah. like mm -hmm. they're the ones who overthrow at the end. Jumping to the end. This is like the longest we've ever gone before jumping to the end. I swear to God. <laughs> jumping to the literal end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're the ones who throw the levers on the water open and yeah. unleash mm -hmm. the water, which to having the wet nurses be the ones who do that. I mean, it's a little mm -hmm. on the nose, but. Yeah, but still. In a way that completely works. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Vivalani. Vuvalini. Vuvalini. <laughs> <laughs> the vulvas um, <laughs> they have such interesting characters and personalities given how little time we actually do spend with them because mm -hmm. i'm like devastated when valkyrie dies you know what i yeah. mean mm -hmm. like well they like they like mostly all die yeah most, most of them yeah. most of them i also do love it's one of my favorite anecdotes from this movie in the first place they all did their own stunts the mm -hmm. old women, which I think is so cool and badass. And in the second place, they were like, someone asked them like why they decided to do it. And one of them was like, well, when am I? I it's, I'm so close to death. I'm never going to get this <laughs> chance again. Well, and she was like, why the hell not? <laughs> that is another thing about the movie is if you actually look, they're going like 25 miles an hour. They're actually course, going very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but it just is edited with the movie. It's um, I don't remember. It's Junkie XL. And but he's not who did the score. Tom, mm. 
Hokenberg. Oh, yeah. No, he is Junkie XL. So I don't know. That's weird. Uh, I Junkie. He, I have a couple of his CDs. He's like a DJ type. He does this type of music. Um. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, even uh, uh, when we were talking about the different types of women, I was, and it, it's something that I obviously notice. But it, like, when Rachel was talking to me, where Rachel was like, "Furiosa is disabled," you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, she's missing a whole arm. And it's just so interesting seeing them work together and compromise because the, another thing that that men got butt hurt about is that the fact that she uses Mad Max as a literal prop in his own movie. Good. Uh, <laughs> more. She should have done it more. Well, but it, it should have been a cut cardboard cutout of Mel Gibson that they just carried around. But it makes the most sense within that scene. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that, that that's not something that the movie itself had to explore was his decision mm-hmm. to trust the women other than, yeah. than oh, the actual God. distrust of people. You know what I mean? Like, Well, of course, he's obviously distrustful at the very beginning. But once he gets a kind of more of a handle on the situation, he's like pretty game pretty fast. <laughs> he get, he gets on board remarkably fast for having such trust issues. And I mean, in total fairness to him, he does think that she is like with the Citadel until he realizes that she stole the wives. Mm hmm. So he's like, you're going to take me back there. And it's like, it has to take a minute to understand. No, she's not. I did want to take a minute to talk specifically about the language. Okay. And this is this is what I meant when I was like, I get more on repeat viewings and stuff mm-hmm. is because they have ways of speaking in this movie. And one of my favorite lines, my favorite line in the movie is the it's Dag says it. I think it's Dag. She says, is mm-hmm. that the wind or a curious or some curious vexation? Mm, yeah. I understand what that means, but that's not the most efficient way to say what she's saying. (laughs) Right. That is sort of all over the movie where it's like you can tell that if society broke down to this degree where we move to a, you know, oral only tradition. And then on top of that, because, I mean, the the implication is that the brides are of a of a higher class, like a ruling Mm -hmm. class. So their education would have been and they are educated because we literally see the school in their cage. Yeah, there's apparently a very convincing version or a very convincing interpretation that this is the book of Revelation. Oh, interesting. There's several. Uh, the, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, um, mm. the head of the of the dragon, the horror. Yeah. yeah, there's like all kinds of like stuff from Revelation that are all over this movie. But I that's that's someplace I couldn't I couldn't go. Um, yeah, I don't want to get right. I don't want to get into that right now. <laughs> One day I'm we good, will. I'm good for now. <laughs> One day I will. <laughs> <laughs> but for the moment, I think I'll pass. <laughs> but uh, I also love when Capable is talking to Nux and she's trying to explain to him what the satellite is. Mm. And she's like, it's a star that used to carry shows through the sky and that yeah. every person had a show that was just for them, mm-hmm. that the star brought them. And it's like, whoa, what a weird way to explain television that I can totally believe passed down after a couple generations. You would lose the understanding of it, but focus on, do you know what I mean? Because she's also like not 100% wrong. No, everyone had a favorite show that that the satellite brought to them. (laughs) But it it, it goes into this fairy godmother-esque quality that's like Mm -hmm. strange. And yeah, I, I do love this is one of the examples because this is they shoot day for night. And this is one of the times where it's wonderful. Um, uh, well, it's so it's so pretty and they make it so, so blue. Mm-hmm. It's like James Cameron blue, mm-hmm. at, like all over the place. And it's so pretty. And it, the the reason I think that it works is that this movie's already so heightened that mm-hmm. when you see it, you're like, well, this just must be what night looks like after the <laughs> gasoline apocalypse. <laughs> and like, I'm just like, OK, fine. But it is just it's breathtaking. I feel like we should talk about at least, you know, showcase a Morton Joe a little bit. But I don't know how I would do that, and certainly not without drawing modern parallels. Yeah, well, so it's the as kind of thing said, that can't be unseen for me, at least. It can't be unseen. Yeah, yeah. So, like we said, it's it's June twenty first in the year twenty twenty. Take from that what you will mm-hmm. about Immortan Joe. <laughs> And his old, diseased, decrepit body with the yeah. see-through armor with fake abs painted into mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and just all of that. And his creepy adult son. 
<laughs> There's several, just a lot of stuff. Several of creepy adult sons. Creepy uh, adult sons. I forgot. Yeah. I like Rictus too. <laughs> he's he's at least like entertaining for mm-hmm. sure. Well, but I yeah, there's brother. there's definitely parallels. <laughs> definitely um, real life parallels. Look, as we all sit I'll here say about a Morton Joe is that he's a smeg who eats schlanger. Um, <laughs> he is definitely a smeg who eats schlanger. About a Morton Joe. <laughs> oh, brother, brother. I do think we can't wind down. We can't like actually finish if we don't at least talk a little bit about Charlize Theron and how fucking amazing she is in this movie. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like one of the best performances of her career, in my opinion. Uh huh. I definitely. I mean, and and I love her. I've loved her from way back. But she manages it's amazing. to do the fall to the knees and scream to the heavens, and not only not have it cheesy or cliche, but have it, it makes be, me cry. Yeah, have it be one of the strongest moments, and d- d- to take something that cliche yeah. and have it be iconic is is it's incredible. She's so she's so good in this. I love uh, I, I love that they're tore up. She really is. And I was that's what I was gonna say is one of the things that I love. It's like I love the fact that like at no point are any bones made about the fact that she is bald and doesn't have an arm. We mm-hmm. are just like led to believe that that's the way things are for her. Mm-hmm. And it just there's like no really mention of how she lost her arm. She barely has a past, and it's so interesting the way that she interacts with the other different characters, because she gets so childlike when they get with the Vuvulini. She's so like, I can't wait for them to see it. I'm so happy I found you. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a change in her face and her whole demeanor. And then once she realizes that they would have passed the green place if they, you know, came the same way. And so it means it's gone. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It's everything about her. And you know what's funny is I think every person that I've talked to about it, they make a weird mental note of the swamp, but no one gets all the way there until that scene. Exactly. Because we're all like, huh, what a weird change in terrain. And then like. (laughs) It's, It's just so fascinating though. And I think a lot of the time, my opinion of Charlize Theron is the same opinion that I have of Brad Pitt, which is that she is an exceptional actress. Like I think almost all the time. And I think she doesn't always get taken seriously the way that she should, because she's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really no surprise that she won her Oscar for a movie where where she is hideous. Was she nominated for this? I don't think so. It, It was nominated but I don't think she was. I think she probably best should picture, have been. Best director, costume production. Yeah, okay, you're right. It did win six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Editing, costume, makeup and hairstyling, sound mixing, sound editing, production design. Mm-hmm. But no, she was not nominated. I think she could have been. Absolutely. I think this is an exceptional performance out of her. And I think it's a shame that movies like this don't get acting nominations frequently. Uh, yes, but also take the win of best 100%. picture and best director because yeah. that's not 100%. common either. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I think I don't remember who did it. It was some reputable enough source, but they had the image of the caravan with the guitar player, the flaming guitar player, mm-hmm. and they picked that as the image of the decade, like the film image of the decade. That's fair. The 2010s? Yeah, Yeah. because this this is regarded as the best action film of the 2010s and even some people say so far the century, but... I think so far the century. I mean, like, John Wick is very good, but this is like a whole different animal. Uh, The difference is this means something a little bit more than John Wick does. Yeah, of course. This packs more of a a philosophical and emotional punch. Yeah. Uh, Because also, I mean... It feels a little odd in the movie that that this is very there and back again, that we get to a middle point and we turn around and go back. But also think about mm-hmm. what that means, especially in terms of humanity and femininity and stuff. And yeah. there's a scene where I forget which bride it is, but they say to Nux, or I think it's uh, Splendid, where she was like, but who who destroyed the world or who ruined the world? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like the men did. So it's like the women have to have to fix it have to replace it and so in that regard something about going back to where you came from just sort of is like but in a yeah let's be honest (laughs) let's be honest too the men would have just kept going Mm -hmm. that kept going away and not asked for directions i love love so much that splendid is the only bride that does die and i cannot Mm -hmm. stress how 
much I love because you talk about the you cry when she like falls in the desert. But for mm-hmm. me, it's this it's the shot of them on the barge being raised. That's a good one, too. Rising. I also I get a little misty. I'll be honest when when the one of the Vuvulini that has the seeds when she dies and the mm-hmm. dad takes the seeds from her so that she can keep them. But just the fact that you don't realize Max isn't with them until yeah, not at first. Yeah. Until you realize that that he's sneaking off into the crowd and Furiosa right. is making eye contact with him. And you see, you know, Furiosa and the bride sort of watching them as, and the way that we, the audience are on the ground watching them elevate above us and it cuts off. Mm-hmm. It reminds me a little bit of what I said about the series finale of the magicians where it's like the story keeps going. We're mm-hmm. just not allowed to watch it anymore. And yeah. we But it's are... also so cool because you can imagine how it proceeds however you want. You can be as hopeful with the future as you want mm-hmm. to be. But but it's but it's almost like a curtain closing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like do we just gradually their faces just are sort of covered and mm-hmm. and we go on because that's one of the things that, you know, I, I had a friend who didn't see this movie at first because he was like well, it's not about Mad Max. Why did the, you know, why didn't they call it Furiosa? And I was like, because it's a Mad Max movie. We Mm -hmm. are, uh, the audience is on the journey with him, even though this particular chapter, he's a supporting player. Right. But it's like when all is said and done, the book closes and we and Max go off on our continued adventures. Like, Mm -hmm. and so there's something about that, because in that regards, it is so 80s. It is so 70s and 80s with like, the sword and, and sandals and the fantasy epics and stuff. And it's like, I we've lamented this several times and I feel like we're finally almost there. Like we're all, we're right on the cusp of realizing that fantasy is fucking amazing. And mm-hmm. I just wish we would lean into it more than we do. You're like, come on guys, let's and especially, do it. Especially aside from whatever Disney property we're property, we're like remangling or yeah. video game. Like just, just make a fantasy film. It doesn't have to be based on a YA series or, right. you know what I mean? Like just make an insane movie. Like, and just trust that we'll figure it out. Like, yeah. we talked very little about actually, like, we talked a little bit about Nux, but we didn't mention that it's Nick Holt. Yeah. Who is, <laughs> we're in a little bit of a Nick Holt renaissance at the moment. We really he are. Is, he's gigging kind of all over the place and he's doing such a good job. For some reason, I had it in my head that I didn't like him, but I'm apparently a huge fan. Uh, and also, I just had to say, like, when the movie was kind of starting, I was like, I forgot how hot all the war boys are. <laughs> mostly on you i don't i don't so feel hot. the same <laughs> i do though um i do just really i think the reason you might not you thought you didn't like him is because you thought basically everybody was miscast in the new x-men movies mm-hmm. and he's in all of them mm-hmm. he's fine in them i don't know i i thought he would because he's also one that i thought he was smaller than he was and like i was watching the great and i was like this man's huge like, yeah, no, he's a very tall person. <laughs> and I he just like his arc, because you mentioned something about Furiosa being like becoming childlike. And it's like mm-hmm. his arc is so strange. And there is something so interesting. Like, well, like I said, it's like when you reduce humanity down to its essentials, like mm-hmm. it's adorable and also devastating how how starved for any sort of attention he is. Well, they all the war boys are like touch starved for sure. Well, yeah, but but it's just like how a woman is nice, nice to him for like five minutes and his entire worldview is thrown into question. Yeah. And that's just like, yikes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's so funny, too, because he's all pouty about not being able to about not succeeding on his mission or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> He does die, doesn't he? He's one of the ones yeah. that sacrifices himself. He does so that they can get away. He he flips the war rig. Right, 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 right. brings the, like, mountain crumbling down so that they can get back to the Citadel mm-hmm. unimpeded. This is one of the rare movies that even not in 3D, it's in 3D. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Like, there's things the, like, are flying at you. <laughs> everything is flying all over the place, like, constantly. The pole cats and the, the guitar mm-hmm. player, that's the Doof Warrior, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, and he's on, like, bungee cords. (laughs) It's insane. My favorite is when he's asleep, and then it's like, whoa, I gotta get going. Yeah, (laughs) it's very good and and silly. That's probably the best gig in this reality. (laughs) 
the doof warrior yeah that's probably the best case like, scenario s- strapped onto the thing mm-hmm. he's blind he can't see playing guitar <laughs> flaming <laughs> I feel guitar like he, i feel like he can feel it <laughs> so <laughs> oh yeah the fucking the organic mechanic that is insane because he's the doctor so they call mm. him an organic mechanic it's like yeah what there's so much there's so much to mine in this movie it's a lot of fun yeah that that's that's about it. I mean, I could go more and I, I, I probably will wish I did, but it's it, it's so good. So, yeah. And it just passed its five year anniversary. So mm-hmm. give it a watch. So I wanted to point out the fact that some things are happening. Some things are in the works and are changing. Um, we're supposed to have a new song and logo that maybe you're seeing or hearing or not. <laughs> we don't know what it's going to be in play, but soon, soon though, we have we have our friends who did the our initial stuff working on mm-hmm. them, and they both uh, are doing other things as well, and then also doing us these favors. So we're, re- we're revamping at them some a bit. point. This year, <laughs> we will have a new logo and a slightly upgraded song. Refresh. We're refreshing. Refresh. Yeah. But we have mentioned this before, uh, and we're going to go ahead and mention it again. But we have a gig over on TV Co., which is a social media app for watching and consuming. Well, it's it's for uh, communities for television. Yeah. Uh, like watching and then talking about mm-hmm. the shows that you like. And we covered Katie Keene. We did full watch parties, which are still available over on the app. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was mixed. It was medium, <laughs> a mixed bag. Uh, I think we, we are... had a good experience, but we didn't <laughs> love the show. Yeah, <laughs> but we are currently in the midst of a Riverdale rewatch. So we're on season two right now. Uh, season one is coming and we'll see where it goes from there. But yep. if you want to hear us and god and love you if you want to look at us yeah <laughs> if you're willing More power to, to that, talk about riverdale we've got that going and it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun revisiting and oh my uh, god yeah we, we didn't get a chance to cover one and two we have covered three and four via mm-hmm. our own show but um yeah so if you get a chance it is tv co tv co you can download the app and follow us there mm-hmm. that's what we're watching yay that is it for us on Mad Max. If you want to follow us uh, on social media, you can follow us on Twitter at So I'm Watching or Instagram at So I'm Watching This Show. We also have a website, So I'm Watching.com, that links out to everything. And other than that, please just rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>